Thank you very much, and thank you to Justin Jones from the Sea Power Center to invite me to speak, joining such august company. I think, um, from my perspective, I know that conference attrition is probably going to set in, so I will try and be brief and interesting. Um, I think that actually it turned out quite well, as these things often do in planning, that Professor Dibb and I are going to speak to you some slightly different but slightly related concepts. And I think the crucial thing that he mentioned that I'd like to bring up is that clearly we are moving away from an era of major war. And that means particularly when we look at government rhetoric about what security threats are, they're actually very non-traditional. And what I'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about how conventional strategy ought to meet non-traditional security threats and how those things converge in the maritime space. So I think that that's largely the structure of my talk. If I get some time towards the end, I may refer to some of the problems of addressing maritime space within academia and what's happening with that today, but we'll see how we do for time. Um, I think that, that Paul alluded to quite correctly, there's a significant problem of sea blindness in the absence of this major warfare that we saw in World War II. People no longer see large carrier groups operating as war fighting machines. And in Australia, that's been compounded by the fact, of course, the two most recent major conflicts were land-based conflicts in the public mind in which navies played a very peripheral role. Now, at a conference like this, I think we all understand, obviously, the importance of the maritime, but I think it's very important to understand that that understanding is not actually widely and generally shared. I think most people actually have very little idea and very little understanding of what navies actually really do. And that's partly because of the presence of land conflicts. And it's also partly because of the fact that navies operate offshore. We don't see them. We don't understand what they do. And that's particularly problematic because a lot of the current security threats that states worry about, everything from um, illegal migration, to people smuggling, to terrorism, to piracy, has a significant maritime component. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through that. Because when we think about maritime issues and the importance of the Navy, what most people think of is this, which is the pattern of Australia's major export partners and how we actually get exports to those markets. And I'm not going to deny that that is an incredibly important feature of Australia's future maritime strategy. But I'm also going to suggest that a number of other maps are equally important to understanding the sorts of security threats that Australia as an island nation faces, but also other nations face, and how they connect to nations around the world and how all of these issues are connected to each other. So when we think about significant threats, what we find is that they all have a significant maritime component, whether or not we're talking about drug trafficking, whether or not we're talking about patterns of illegal migration, whether or not we're talking about patterns of human trafficking, usually for the sex trade, but not always, whether or not we're talking about international pirate incidents and counter piracy, and whether or not we're talking about illegal and, I'm just gonna call it IUU fishing, it's a mouthful. But I think that one of the things that we need to realize is how deeply connected all these issues are, not just by the fact that they all occur in the maritime, because of course, if you can smuggle large quantities of drugs, you can also smuggle weapons, be it unconventional weapons or conventional weapons. You can smuggle people, and those people may be terrorists who you're trying to move from one place to another. So the maritime is an excellent pathway for all sorts of illicit behavior, which may be criminal, but has a significant potential international security impact. And one of the big engines of doing these sorts of things, we're going to come back to in a minute, is the idea of IUU fishing. But all of these maritime security threats that I've talked about tend to share a series of root causes. So they tend to be associated with poverty. They tend to be associated with the absence of legal employment opportunities in a lot of states where this comes from. They tend to be associated, obviously, with proximity to shipping lanes. I grew up in uh, landlocked Western Canada, and there weren't a lot of pirates. Um, Often, there is a significant component of environmental threat, either directly in the case of fishing or in the case of a very compelling narrative as to why the illegal behavior is occurring, which is what's happened in the case of the Somali pirates who claim that the reason why they became pirates is because, um, because of environmental degradation and illegal fishing. So maritime crime is in itself threatening, and it's threatening in terms of the cost of diverting shipping around pirate routes. It's threatening in terms of the 
dangers that people being smuggled into countries like Australia may pose, but it also facilitates much broader and wider security threats. And since I've been researching in this area, one of the things that has struck me is the importance of IUU fishing. Um, I used to think it was just about stealing fish and therefore not particularly interesting, but when you think about it, an illegal fishing vessel can be the motor that drives a whole range of illegal behavior, again, which in turn can have serious impact. So if you have an illegal fishing vessel, you can use it to smuggle just about anything. Because it is illegal, it's easier to get, bring it in and out of harbors. These criminal networks tend to be very good at knowing who to bribe and where to bribe them. Um, and they also are engaged in many of these activities, including the pretty horrifying phenomenon of children and adults being trafficked to work on the fishing vessels themselves and often being at sea for two or three years before they're put to shore. So I think that the problem with countering this as a strategic situation is that criminal threats are very complicated and criminal security threats are even more complicated. Because once you get this nexus between war and crime, the question is, at which end of it do you begin to counter it? Do you tackle the crime end? Do you tackle the war end? Or do you actually try and tackle them both simultaneously? And if you do that, how on earth do you go about it? Um, the other real reason, this is something I alluded to in, the, in a presentation that I gave on Monday, is that crime is always organized. We tend to per perceive crime as lawlessness, but actually crime is a highly organized activity, otherwise it wouldn't really work. And like any organized activity, it's also a business. So criminals have a very high incentive to keep going with what they're doing. So when we try and control them, what we typically do is make better criminals. And this is a known paradox in, for people who study organized crime and people who counter organized crime and policing forces. So how do we even try to begin to control some of this without causing criminals to innovate, change their business practices, and actually become a whole lot better and a whole lot scarier at what they do? And I think the fact that all these businesses evolve under pressure, again, is very visible in the maritime space. So this is, of course, one of these drug submarines. This one was captured off the coast. This one was captured in Ecuador in 2011. And these submarines have gone from being very unsophisticated to increasingly sophisticated as a way to evade maritime detection from the Caribbean. We can see it in all, other, of all others of the types of organized criminal security threat that I've mentioned as well. There is also no question that corruption is what makes this go round. Corruption is the grease that makes everything work. Where you have corruptible officials, you have the possibility to do all of, all of these sorts of criminal behavior. And again, it's particularly worrying and problematic in harbor areas where you can do everything from have someone forge you an illegal fishing license, do someone help you sell off an illegally captured ship, or help you sell off the ship's cargo, or help you move people in and out of port without being too closely inspected. The real problem with corruption, of course, is corruption is a problem in every state in the world. And it's very, very difficult to stamp it out in places when it's become endemic, but it also exists in countries which we don't typically perceive to be very corrupt. Without corruption, it would be much harder to conduct organized crime. And clearly all of these activities that I've just mentioned have a really significant and impressively enormous human cost. And I think, again, we can't get away from that too much when we think about what does security mean in a world where major war is absent? Surely part of what security must mean is looking after people and looking after humans. And the danger we've got in all of these types of organized crime is that they are full of victims and um, usually who are treated in horrific and appalling ways. So what does this all mean for the future of maritime strategy and, and why have I come to talk to you about it today? Well, I think obviously this sort of security threat poses an enormous challenge for not just maritime forces, but for policymakers generally. But it also offers some really interesting opportunities, because if we begin to understand security threats in this way, I think we can think of better ways to counter them, we can think of ways to be more agile in response to them, and we can think of ways to bring people involved in the security process who typically haven't been involved in that process. And organizations like navies can sort of begin to think about how they might reimagine and reconfigure what they do in light of these new security threats. So in policy terms, one of the things that, again, I found very interesting since I've started researching this issue is if 
I'm right in saying that, that there's this funny hybrid threat between a domestic criminal problem and an international criminal problem that melds into some sort of scary international security problem. We would then expect, wouldn't we, that there would be an awful lot of joint military and policing work where people talked to each other quite a lot about how you go about conducting policing operations if you're a Navy and where police and Navy talk to the police about the sort of challenges they face. We would also expect that where there are parallel operations, people would talk to each other. And I've organized for the past couple of years a conference on maritime security with the Hudson Trust in Oxford. And the first one we had, we thought, well, what we'll do is we'll bring in all the policymakers that we can find who work on these relative maritime security issues. So we had people who dealt with IEU fishing. And most interestingly, and apropos of this slide, we had um, a bunch of two or three people come from Jayadev South, which if I'm sure you all know, but that's the um, multinational, multi-agency command structure that deals with counter-narcotics in the Caribbean. And we thought that this would be really interesting for us as the academics in the room, that we would learn an enormous amount about how you might do something like counter-piracy at sea from how they did counter-narcotics at sea. What we didn't think was that the policymakers who were there would have much to say to each other because we presumed they had met before and discussed this kind of stuff extensively. And of course they hadn't. And in fact they were only by luck and chance in terms of how people's postings and work aware of what the other group is really doing. And a lot of it was directly relevant, both this business of criminal threats evolving and becoming more complicated. And here we have, this is a US Coast Guard vessel, um, and that's one of the, the drug submarines. Similar things eventuate in piracy. But that a lot of the pressures and difficulties that people felt doing counter-narcotics were directly applicable to counter-piracy. So one of the policy challenges here is not only to get military and police to cooperate better and understand what they're doing, but to actually practically think of, well, when we do this type of activity in one field, how is piracy related to IUU fishing? How do the measures that we take to work against IUU fishing apply to counter piracy, to counter narcotics, to the potential movement of drugs and money to facilitate terrorist organizations and terrorist groups? Um, and of course, one of the things, and this is, uh, this is obviously the impact of the, of the Jaida South on a particular operation on the cocaine trade, but one of the problems is when you have illegal movements of anything, it's an excellent way both to launder money and to make money. And we have found typically there's a very strong correlation between these activities and terrorist and insurgent organizations. It's a really, really good way to make money. And this is another way that these maritime security threats, which may or may not be threatening in and of themselves, can feed into a broader and more worrying threat is just simply through the money. The other thing that I think is more of a really interesting opportunity is that all of our high seas problems, and indeed most of our maritime problems, whether or not they're on the high sea, are problems of the global commons. And what we see, and what's very interesting for me, as someone who started my research career looking at land-based issues, is how relatively easy and interesting multinational cooperation is when you're trying to protect the global, col the global commons. When I describe to people the shape of the counter-piracy missions that operate in the Indian Ocean and the fact that although they're not formally cooperating, there is an awful lot of important cooperation which happens between nations as diverse as Iran, India, Russia, Canada, Australia. People are quite astounded that it works. And part of the reason why it works is because of the fact that to, for these maritime threats to be properly countered, they actually require a multinational response, as opposed to, on the, in the land context, having to have a multinational response out of fears of legitimacy, out of fears of you're doing the right thing. This is a situation where if you're not doing it multinationally, no one would have the resources to be able to do it at all. And so that's an important feature of potentially maritime diplomacy, of getting states to work together who haven't worked together in the past, but also represents a really interesting opportunity for navies like Australia to take a leadership role. International cooperation, as I've mentioned, is, is crucial and is very interesting in terms of how it works, but it's not the only part of the story. And I think this comes back again to the notion of how to affect greater military and policing cooperation. And that can't just be within a state, although that's very important. It also has to be thinking about how to do these things better internationally um, because of the international nature of the threats that we're discussing.
So what does all of this mean for strategy? And what would our friend Klausowitz here make of what I've been saying? Because one of the things, of course, when we talk about strategy is typically we use the word war quite a lot, that strategy is about trying to make war usable, or it's about connecting war to goals. But none of what I've spoken about today comes anywhere close really to actual war. So do our conventional notions of strategy still apply? And if they do, how do they apply? And if they don't, what does that mean? And I think these are really important questions that we need to begin to grapple with. Traditional strategic studies scholars have typically been very resistant to the idea of expanding security into greater things. Um, and they wanted to restrict the definition and the understanding of strategy to the kind of major war that both of us have discussed this morning is quite likely to be obsolete or at least very, very rare. So if that's the case, what do we do? I think there may be some suggestion that pervasive insecurity is a serious problem, but maybe we shouldn't use war sorts of methods to deal with it. But the difficulty with that is that we already do in so many different types of environments, whether or not it's land forces attempting to conduct counterinsurgency who get involved in the business of crime fighting against the production of opium, or naval forces at sea who are really taking on a crime fighting role in countering piracy. None of those ideas fall into our traditional notions of strategy, and I don't have all the answers for it, and I don't think anyone would be able to have all the answers for it, but I think it's a really important question to ask. If war has changed and the security threats that militaries prepare for have changed, then we also need to change the way we think about it, and that's quite crucial. I think that one of the things that people often say is, well, maybe we shouldn't, maybe the problem is we shouldn't think about this stuff as a security threat at all. And I think in some cases that's probably true. I think it's highly debatable, and we've seen it debated extensively in the media in this country for the past year, as to whether or not illegal migration to Australia constitutes a security threat and whether or not we ought to be treating it as one. But to an extent, I think the genie is out of the bottle on this question. It may or may not be a real security threat, but we've been treating it like one for so long, and one of our main modes of dealing with it is, of course, the use of our military means that we have begun, we have effectively made it impossible to say this is no longer a security threat which we're going to counter with military means. And that's also true with international piracy, which is actually... Pirates are sea robbers. This is a criminal problem. But for a whole variety of political reasons, partly having to do with Somalia and the region, it's simply impossible to deal with it as a policing problem. So we use very expensive military means to deal with it. And this relates to something also that Paul mentioned in his speech, is that in a time of increased fiscal restraint, do you really need to use very, very, very expensive military means to counter criminal threats? And ought we be reconsidering slightly how about we go doing some of these things. And I think this is the big question, is that a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about moves navies directly into a crime-fighting role. And I think, again, the ship has sailed, as it were, to use a bad pun, um, on whether or not navies should be doing this, because navies are doing this, not just the Australian Navy, but navies around the world. But again, I question whether or not we have really thought through what the implications are of turning our navies into crime-fighting forces. How do we pay for it? Do we need the same sorts of do we need the same sorts of material to do it? If what we're really doing is becoming a big crime-fighting force, do we need big amphibious assault vehicles? It, not outside of the Australian context, but do we need aircraft carriers? What sorts of things do you need if this is going to be a crucial component of Navy's roles? Um, and I think, again, the multinationality of it is also really important. I've said it's, I think it's easier in a lot of ways to do effective multinational cooperation at sea, but it's not without challenges. And it would be very useful to have some high-level strategic thinking about how this multinational cooperation at sea works and how we might be able to make it to work better. And I'm just going to finish very briefly um, by talking about engaging with people like me who are sometimes in an ivory tower, but hopefully not always. I think that one of the challenges with all of this, all of these threats that I've talked about, is that their complexity is also partly an interdisciplinary complexity. So if you really wanted to go out and say, okay, I, I take this stuff quite seriously, I'm really interested in countering this hybrid threat. Where do I find the people who think about this, who research on it, and can help me think about it further? And the answer is you find them 
in probably dozens of different disciplines, from sociologists who work on organized crime. I've had some really interesting conversations with people who work on mafias, which have really informed my own work on piracy, um, to people who work on technical aspects of the maritime space. And all of these people can be brought in to assist and help navies in sorting out their problems. And I think that is actually crucially important because um, this number represents the amount of formal training I've had on maritime issues during the course of my PhD. It also represents the number of PhD students that I am aware of at the University of Oxford who are writing PhDs in international relations on maritime subjects. I think one of the problems we've got is that the focus on land conflict has meant that an awful lot of academics in the social science space, not in the science space, are working extensively on land-based military questions. So I can think of dozens of people who are writing PhD theses on counterinsurgency. And you guys may quite rightly not care about whether or not those people are writing good or bad theses or that they're writing them at all. But the point is in terms of future expertise that you can draw from, in terms of awareness and importance about what navies do, it really matters that people tend not to look at the maritime in their work because it demonstrates that people don't realize how much these important maritime issues undergird the wider security picture in the way that I've just been talking about. I think a lot of the stuff I've been talking about is a lot more interesting than working on counterinsurgency that everybody else is working on. But once you have that population of people, you can bring them in. They can help think and discuss the big maritime security and strategy questions. And it's probably the only way to consider the hybrid nature of those threats that I've been talking about. The fact that if we overlaid all of these maps on each other about drug trafficking, people smuggling, we would see more dramatically the need to really counter this, not just from a policy coordination, from a multinational coordination approach, but by bringing people in to think about these issues who maybe haven't ever been approached before, who maybe even haven't started to think about these issues at all. So that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say today. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions in the question period. <laughs>